Hey kids, today we're going to be talking about the Typing Rebellion. Now, you've probably heard of this in your middle school days while watching lists of deadliest conflicts in human history at 3 a.m. while playing a good old game of five on one with your friends, but probably knew nothing else about it. And boy, if you thought your first internet relationship was a clusterfuck, then have I got the show for you. This conflict is just so friggin' loony that even I have to put the disclaimer that this is oversimplified. So go read up on it if you can. So the story begins with a poor man named Hong Shi Xuan who lived in a poor village in South China during the Qing Dynasty. He was a Hakka, an ethnic group mostly consisting of poor laborers, and the empire at the time was run by the Manchus, another ethnic minority. And naturally, there were some real tensions between the two. Now, China was kind of in bad times, being smack in the middle of the century of humiliation, as they now call it, with the population nearly doubling in less than a century, big famines, natural disasters, defeats by foreign powers, high taxes, massive rent, opium everywhere, corrupt government, you know, small stuff like that. But luckily for Hong, he was from a wealthier family, so he got to go to school to prepare for the imperial examinations, which are a nearly impossible set of Tess needed to become a Chinese official. Now, poor Hong tried taking the exams four times. That's right, four times, failing every time. Now, like most college students just begging for life to throw them a bone or just end them, he didn't take his failures very well. So in 1837, he just broke down and got sick for a few days. During his illness, he started having these literal fever dreams and crazy visions. Hey, uh, you doing all right? I am the second son of God! All right, cool. Apparently, in his visions, Hong saw a divine father who he thought must be God, and a heavenly brother of his who he thought must be Jesus himself. So he takes his newfound revelation to the local missionary, Issachar Jaco Robert, to learn all he can about Christianity, having only found out about it from a pamphlet years earlier. And it went like, So kids, in Mark chapter 19, Jesus, my big brother? Uh, sure. But anyways, he said that when someone wrongs you, you kill all the Manchus. Uh, the guy then straight up refuses to baptize him, and Hong has to go home. Now, I'm sure by now all of you are wondering just what's next for Hong. But luckily, Hong did what any rational person would do at that point. He gathers a bunch of hakas like himself, starts up a cult calling them the God-Worshipping Society, then fucking takes over the region of Guangxi, seizing all private property and establishing a proto-communist state, calling it the, get this, Typing Heavenly Kingdom. Wow, he is just so relatable. I hope I can be just like him one day. Yeah, me too. Slay King. Now, the Taiping military was surprisingly well off for a peasant rebellion, complete with modern firearms and even imported American pistols for themselves. Another thing that separated them from armies at the time was that they had a large sector of female soldiers led by Hong's own sister, Xuan Zhao. And no, they weren't hot, you horny little fuck. So in 1853, the Taiping forces split into three, with one staying to defend their stronghold, one going west, and one going north to take out Beijing and the emperor himself. The northern expedition was a total disaster, but the western campaign was much more successful by enlisting the help of the Chinese river pirates and the fucking triads. They were able to take much of southern China at the time. So by now, I'm sure you're all wondering just what was life like under the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom? And boy, did it live up to its name. Naturally, Hong was all about societal reform, so a lot of new rules were implemented. Some were typical commie stuff like abolishing land ownership, a collective public fund, outlawing social classes, starving the people, burning all their enemies to death. They also had some laws based off of Hong's own personal mistranslation of the Bible, like the strict separation of sexes. Now, while women were equal in typing society, the two sexes couldn't live together, and even married couples were prohibited from having sex. <laughs> no sex? Yeah, what the fuck is this authoritarian bullshit? Yeah, I'm out. Unstamped. Now you're probably wondering how a society like this could survive more than a generation, but luckily for us, they didn't even last a tenth of that. Now the leadership of the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom consisted of Hong, his brother Zhao, who was apparently a mouthpiece for Jesus Christ, and his commander Yang, who could apparently speak as God himself. But anyways, things quickly fell apart when one day Yang was like, Hmm, I'm having one of those God moments, hmm. <gasps> what is he saying? What is he saying? He's saying, hmm, <gasps> that I should be the new emperor. And then all those pretty ladies over there need to be relocated to the palace bedroom immediately. Hmm. Dude, that's my sister. Don't backtalk your father like that. So after that, Yang tried to organize a coup to overthrow Hong, and Hong subsequently had him and all his followers executed. Some say that Zhuang Zhao was also part of the coup. But hey, I guess we all have a few skeletons in our closets. 
In the meanwhile, the Qing dynasty slowly got its footing and, with the help of local militias, began to retake southern China. The dynasty then got its big break by, ironically enough, its own western enemies, France and Britain, who lent them army leaders like Commander Frederick Townsend Ward and Major General Charles Gordon, who led the Chinese troops on the offense. All the while, Han began to become more and more isolated, probably distracted by his husband's concubines. <clears throat> and at last, the Qings finally cornered Hong in the Taiping capital of Nanjing and laid a big and slaughtery siege. Eventually, in 1864, they got in, only to find that Hong is already dead from, get this, eating wild vegetables outside the city, which he apparently thought was manna. Now, it goes without saying, but if I were to die as a revolutionary in a giant siege, I'd want it to be from a thousand spears, all piercing me at once, as the last of my men safeguarding my throne with a sharpened spoon, not from fucking unwashed lettuce. The Qings then blasted his remains out of a cannon to ensure that he would never have a resting place. And that, kids, marked the end of the Taiping Rebellion. Pirates, triads, women warriors, and communism? What in the Kentucky Fried fuck is this shit? Oh ho ho, Sonny. I haven't even gotten to the part where me and the boys ran to Taiwan to take it from the Japanese. Are you just off your meds or a fucking lunatic? Maybe both, actually. At the end of the day, a whopping 20 million people died. Partly because the only Geneva Convention of the day was genocide, and partly due to the fact that all the city raising led to even more disease and famine for the Chinese citizens. Now, I'm sure most of you guys watching are like, Really? Just really? He turned one of the most tragic and downright dis- disgusting abominations of a war in human history into a comedic education video? Yes. Yes, I did. I'm Samuel Drella, and... <clears throat> <laughs>